Let's continue here at the bottom of page 121. Um, does anyone want to read? Okay, and thank you, Margo, for pointing to the place. It starts with the words, unlike the tikkunim. Anyone? Okay, I will. Oh, go ahead. Please. Go, go ahead, Linda. Me. Go ahead, okay. Linda, please. Yeah. Unlike the tikkunim, the, the say it for me, please. The, the levushim, right. The garments, right? Constitute the outer expressions of the soul and are distinct from it. The soul has the choice whether to drive, dress itself in them or not, just as a person can clothe himself in a garment or remove it without affecting any change in himself. This analogy, oh, this is not the case with the more internal tikkunim, which to extend the analogy are more like a body to the soul. In essence, the body and the soul are two different entities, but the soul embodies itself in the body to the extent that in many respects, the body and soul come to, to, to comprise a single entity. A soul cannot remove or change its body without itself changing. Right, the body itself has to change. The soul uh, can do that. How do you change the, the body? By, um, again, changing the garments. Now it's interesting because you know, we live in a society where we give, I think, where we give so much attention to thoughts, speech, and action, uh, and to uh, the thoughts that I have, or I would even go further. I think there's another layer of things that we give attention to, and that's feelings. The feelings that we are, that we have, sorry, are are very often sanctified. If these are my feelings, that might be true, and that that those must reflect my inner eye. Those are my thoughts. I can't just get rid of thoughts. That, that thoughts define me. Here, very clearly, the Tanya says they're changeable. No, don't let those define you. The only thing that can really define you is your soul. You know, we, we use two words that, and I know there's a whole book called I am, but those two words, I am, uh, and people say this all the time, really um, are very, very often misused because we, we use them as saying, I am um, happy, I am sad, or even deeper definitions, I am schizophrenic, mm. I am um, anorexic, whatever it may be. We use that for mental diseases, we use this for mood, moods, we use this for the color of the skin. I'm not gonna go into politics, obviously, but look at what's happening. I am black, I am white. Now. That's not what defines us, according to the Tanya, according to Judaism in general. The only word that you can put after I am is I am divine. That's the only word that you can put. Because... I better act like one. Sorry? So I better act divine. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Now, now, that's the only word that you can put. and That's the soul that you have, right? You, your soul is divine. That's who you are. Now, how you choose then to express that divinity, that depends on you. If you choose to express it in a very undivine way, then you will be betraying that I am, that only I am that you are. If you choose to express it in a divine way, then you'll be in line with the I am that you are. And that's, that's the levushim. Don't tell me, oh, I'm feeling this. I'm sanctifying my feelings. I'm feeling a little gloomy today, and therefore I am gloomy. No, you're not. Change that. Change that feeling. You think ne you're thinking negative. I have all these negative thoughts coming to me. I'm, I'm, I'm a negative person. I've, I've, I've heard this, I'm sure you have. I've heard this said by so many people. I'm such a negative person sometimes. And excuse me, you are not negative. You are not, don't put any word after that I am instead of divine. Well, you change those thoughts. If, if, if you think that those thoughts is what's making you a negative person, so change them. And change those, spe those words that you are using in your speech. Change those actions. Change those level shame. That's how... We, we can align, and that's exactly what the last line is saying. That's why we can align, that's how we can align our body with our soul. The soul cannot remove or change its body without itself changing. Let's change our body. The soul is divine. Soul is not affected by this, but it, it's not allowed expression if we, if, we, if we don't use the body correctly, if we don't use our thoughts, speech, and action correctly. So let's remember that first and foremost, at our core, we are divine. And then everything else, our feelings, our thought, our speech, our action, and everything else that come along with that should then be aligned with that only I am that truly exists. That's really what this paragraph is saying. You know, I'll uh, 
this coming Thursday is the yard site of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, which, which we've mentioned uh, many times, Rabbi Menachem Schneerson of Blessed Memory, uh, 26 years since he's passing. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a story I may or may have not have shared with you, but a story about this uh, woman who was diagnosed as narcissistic. She had narcissism. And she always thought about herself. And um, when she came to the Rebbe with a medical file and said, look, I'm narcissistic, I don't know what to do. Uh, the Rebbe looked at the file, went through every document there very quickly. And he said to her, I don't see what the problem is. <laughs> he said, what do you mean? He, I'm, I'm narcissistic, can't you see? That's the conclusion of the doctors. The Rebbe says, I still don't see what the problem is. This speaks about something of the past. What are you today? What will you be tomorrow? That you can change. What you are does not change. Don't tell me you're narcissistic because then you'll, you won't change that. I'll tell you what you are. You're a divine soul. That's who you are. That won't change. Tomorrow you'll be a divine soul. Now the only question is what will you do today? What will you do tomorrow to reflect the divine soul? I suggest to get out of this narcissism that you say you have, not that you are, but that you have. Then go and visit the sick. Go and be kinder to, to the people around you. He even gave her the advice of, you know, at lunchtime, you're in school right now, at lunchtime, go and sit next to your friends and see if you can bring some lunch for them. Be kind to them. And then you'll see that that will go away. And that's exactly what she did. Now, he did two things, I think, brilliantly, the Rav Chareb, but probably more. And one thing is that the first and foremost thing he did is that don't define yourself by this medical file. That's not who you are. That's, so what? That maybe that's, that spoke of some, something about you in the past. Today, you can still change. And secondly, he gave her a tool. This is what you have. So break it by changing your garment, by changing your levushim. You think you're not selfish, narcissistic? Change that levush, like the Tanya is saying right here. Go ahead and be kind. Not be nice to, the, the, to your friends during lunchtime or, or go and visit the sick. But that's, that's, I think that's the brilliance here of this Tanya, something that must be, I think, said over and over again in our day and age that sanctifies so much feelings, thoughts, speech, and action that we think that they become who we truly are. When again, the only thing that we truly are is a divine soul. I'd love to hear your comments and then we can continue. But first, let this be a true study, a dialogue. Anyone? Hmm. Well, you know, Rabbi, uh, many years ago when they were implementing um, Casual Friday. Yeah. I worked with uh, an American Express office of um, accounting and they were instituting it and work was getting a little slovenly. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And so I went in and said, that's because you have no rules. If you're going to have casual Friday, you need to define what does that really mean? Does that mean khakis and polo shirts or does that mean torn blue jeans and, you know, and, and t-shirts? What does that mean? And they had to define it because it changed the behavior in the office. Mm. Right. And, um, and because they were a professional office and because people would come to them, clients, for professional reasons, they really couldn't afford to do that. Right, right. right. You know, I mean, it just really was a mistake for them. I mean, casual is one thing, but um, it, casual with, but tasteful because you become what you look like. <laughs> you kind of do. These people did. They they became less conscientious when right. they didn't care what they looked like. Right. No, very good point. Very good point. You know, uh, as I as we mentioned before, God belongs everywhere, and He belongs even to the bedroom, and that's why you have the code of Jewish law doesn't hesitate to go to the bedroom uh, to speak about how God would want you to act there. It also speaks about how you should dress. There's an actual halacha of how you should dress. And the definition of Jewish law is that you can't dress with haughty clothes. That's the expression. Clothes that will bring you haughtiness. You know, I don't know, gold and silver, like, uh, I don't know, King Louis the the VI of France of the 16th century. But on the other hand, you also can't dress with, with, with poor, disrespectful clothes that disrespect you, undignifying clothes. Uh, you have to find like the moderate type of clothes that don't make you arrogant, but don't make you also too lowly. So there we go. You see, you have you have a definition in halacha of what clothes you should wear. Now I'm going to go a step further, but it's interesting. 
that the priest who served in the temple had clothes that they had to wear. The regular Kohen had to wear four different types of clothes, and the high priest had to wear eight different types of clothes. Now, why? I mean, why, why, why tell the priest, leave them alone? They're coming to serve you. They're coming to, to take care of the temple, to ensure that everything runs smoothly, and you're going to tell them what clothes to wear. But the answer is exactly what you're saying, Linda. No, you're in the temple. Don't ever forget that. And the clothes, they four, even the physical clothes, have to reflect uh, who you are and have to remind you constantly of your divine duty. So you had clothes. By the way, that opens up the discussion of whether you believe that schools should have uniform or not. Should schools have uniform? Now, in public schools, they don't. But should the government impose that or not? In private schools, many private schools decide to have uniform at least a few days a week. But it opens up that discussion because you're right. Some people then come dressed in a way that's completely not just undignifying to them, but undignifying to the school and undignifying to the uh, education that, want, that you want them to have. So that's a whole different discussion. But again, just the fact that there is a discussion about it proves how garments are really important. Yes. And if physical garments are so important, even more so spiritual garments, thought, speech, and action. And those when, children... when we say in the morning, uh, one of our blessings is Malbisha Rumim. We're thanking God for giving us clothes. Are we referring to the physical garments or are we referring to the spiritual garments? That, that's a beautiful, uh, thank you, William. Thank you for, I didn't think of that. You're right. One of the blessings in the morning blessings uh, there's multiple of them. Uh, God makes the, the blind open up their eyes and uh, one, uh, you know, Sekol uh, Tzorki, that you, God gives us all that we need. One of the blessings is that God clothes the naked. Now, this refers to specifically physical garments, but, but the word for naked in Hebrew, Malbish Agumim, Arumim, is also the word for sly. Armumi, that's sly or, or dishonest. So what we are saying in the morning on a, in a spiritual level is that God, uh, we bless God for clothing the sly. What does it mean to clothe the sly? That you have any, if you have any dishonesty in you, any slyness in you, clothe it. Ah. Clothe it with, 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 um, with truth. Clothe it with divinity. And then hopefully that slyness will, you know, you fake it until you make it, so to speak. That slyness will, will go away. So there's a deeper, that's a good point, William. That there's a deeper meaning to that Malbisha Rumin blessing. And we're thanking God not just for clothing us, but for also enabling us, to, giving us the tools to get rid of our slyness, of our dishonesty. Hmm. Interesting. By the way, again, proves this point, right? That clothes, the way you express yourself through especially thought, speech, and action is, has an effect in the, in the diseases that you may have. Not that you are gay. You are only divine, but you have maybe inner spiritual diseases like slyness. So then start thinking honestly, speaking honestly, and acting honestly. And that inner disease that you may have, whether it's narcissism like that story or or slyness, that will go away. I think that that should uh, maybe open up a whole new school of psychology. Did the, the Lubavitcher Rebbe ever meet Trump? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I think the question should be the opposite. Did Trump ever meet the Lubavitcher Rebbe? <laughs> it arrange it. Wouldn't that be something? Yeah. It would have been, I, think, I think history would have been different. Oh, I hope no one's going to the rally on uh, this, this week in uh, Phoenix. Uh, oh, Is no. This week? Hope not. Okay. I hope all those people who went yesterday, you know, don't end up really sick. I mean, that was such a risk they were yeah. taking. Some of them will. Yeah. And, but again, you see, it all connects. Speech, thought, speech. I mean, yeah, we have problems with speech, but thought, speech, and action. Those actions. are common really define who you're, who, who, like your your outer self. And we have control over that, complete control over that. Um, 
And by the way, sometimes it's, it's, it's a question also of just, um, sometimes you, I, I would say again, we can, I, like I just said, we can open up a whole new school of psychology that focuses on healing through thought, speech, and action. And I think it will be a very effective school of psychology. But I think there's, and I don't want to minimize it, there's many, many layers to it. But, but if, if we had to condense it into two layers, uh, I think there's, there's two layers of how to work on a thought, speech, and action so that it reflects best the inner eye like we've speak, been speaking about. One, sometimes we're not equipped to actually change our thought, to actually change our speech, start speaking in a more refined way, and to actually, because of uh, educational habits that we have, societal pressure, whatever it may be, sometimes we're not equipped. But what we, every one of us is equipped to do at least at stage one is to drop them. You have a bad thought, go think about something else. Maybe you're not equipped now to work on that bad thought, to ask yourself, well, what's the root of it so that I can uproot it altogether? Please stop, stop, just, just leave it behind. Think of something else. Or well, same with speech. You, you have a negative thing, thing to say, you don't, you don't exactly know yet how to work on yourself. Where is this coming from? How to uproot the disease within you? Fine, so at least don't say it. Like I tell my children, if you have nothing good to say, just don't, don't say it. it. Don't say it. With action. If you're about to do something bad and, and you don't know what, fine, so just don't do it. So we have at least at stage one, we have the ability to completely disown those things. To say, okay, I'm, I'm not gonna even go there. And that's, that's, that's I think, tool, tool one. And then eventually we can, when we are emotionally and even intellectually equipped, then we can go to the root of it and start working inwardly to try and change uh, bad habits. Maybe but, it doesn't matter. Maybe the root of it doesn't matter nearly as much as the behavior that you put out. So you keep behaving in a, in a kind way, no matter what the root of it is, you, you're teaching the root to change. You're making it grow in a right. different way. So maybe, maybe we put too much emphasis on the root and not enough on the action. Beautiful. That's right. I, I so agree. And Tanya so agrees. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's... Um, did I ever share with you the story? I don't know. I, I repeat myself a lot and I apologize. But did I ever share with you the story of the happy hypocrite? It's a yeah. small book. You can get it on Amazon by uh, an author of some 100 years ago. I don't, know if he, I don't even know if he was Jewish. It sounds Jewish. Max Birnbein is the author. But it's basically a story. I mean, the details are much more elaborated. But uh, it's a story about a man who was evil. And he had many root problems, like you speaking about, Linda. And um, eventually, it was time for him to get married. And he walked into a bar, and he fell in love with this woman, and he wanted to marry her. Remember the story, or maybe I didn't share it. Yeah. And, yeah. and of course, he was evil, so she was disgusted by him, and no way. Now, he was so in love, he said to himself, I gotta marry this woman, but she won't marry me. So he decided to wear a mask so that she wouldn't recognize him, and then start the whole courting again. So <laughs> he wears a perfect mask that's, you know, like a Hollywood type of mask that's attached mm -hmm. to your skin. And he goes back to the bar and she doesn't recognize him and they start a relationship. They fall in love or fall in lust. I don't believe in falling in love. <laughs> and eventually they uh, get married. And now they've been married for quite a few years and they're walking in the street and they bump into this friend of his from a long time ago. And he sees right through his mask and he says, hey, I recognize you. You're this evil person. Mm. His wife says, well, what are you talking about? He hasn't been evil. He's only been good to me. No, 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 you don't know who you got married to. I'll prove it to you. He's wearing a mask. I can see right through it. And then he jumps on him to try and prove his point, to detach the mask. And he's able to control him and he's a, and is slowly but surely trying to detach his mask, but he's unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the more he tries to detach the mask, his mask, the more he realizes that he's detaching a part of his skin. The mask had become a part of him. Mm. That's, that's the story. But it's a story that proves exactly this point and what you're saying too, Linda. That sometimes all that is needed, fine. It's hard for you. So wear a mask, fake it. Fake it until you make it. And then it will become a part of you. It will become such a part of you that it will define the real you, the, the new real you. 
Yeah. And uh, on the outside, of course, the inner you never changes, like we said. And and then act good and act good again and act good again. And that evil persona that you thought you may have had will then disappear. That's that's really the idea. You know, um, I think there's many examples of that. Many, many examples of that, but um, in history. But there's a great story about the author of the Tanya. Um, just thinking of Oscar Schindler, by the way. Oscar Schindler was a man who was, was bad. We spoke about him, right? But eventually he did good and did good. And that's how he was defined. That's how he's remembered today. As someone who saved some 2,000 Jews in the Holocaust. But the author of the Tanya, Rabbi Shnel Zaman of Liari, who, um, um, you know, is responsible for our soul study each and every Sunday. But Rabbi Shnel Zaman of Liari has a great, there's a great story about him, how he fundraised once for the poor of his village. And he came to this very wealthy man who was known to be a big miser. And um, um, everyone told him, don't go to him. He won't give you anything. He never gives anything to the poor. You're wasting your time. Mashnel Zaman of Liari said, I'm going anyway. And he went to two of his helpers and he knocked on his door. And the wealthy man is there and says, what do you want from me? He says, well, we're raising money for the poor of our village. Do you mind giving us some tzedakah? And the poor man says, you, I think you're wasting your time. He says, please, do me a favor, please. The wealthy man goes to his little can of coins, takes a coin from there, and throws it at Rabbi Shnel Zaman of Liari. And he says, Here, here's my tzedakah, and I get out of my house. Mm-hmm. Rabbi Shnel Zaman of Liari says to him, thank you so much. I really appreciate you giving me this tzedakah. I can't thank you enough. And he goes and he takes the coin. Now, this is a, the biggest insult, but he really thanked him. He took the coin and the wealthy man had never had a reaction like this. So he says to her, so let me give you something else. And he goes back to the can of coins and throws him another coin. He says, yes, more tzedakah. He says, okay, thank you so much. I can't thank you enough. Slowly but surely, the guy keeps giving him more and more. And again, Rabbi Shnel, thank you so much. Eventually, the wealthy man invited Rabbi Shnel Zaman of Liari and his helpers into the house. And he gave him a nice sum of money for the poor of the village. When he came out, the helpers couldn't believe it. And people heard about this wealthy man, the miser, giving such a nice sum for the first time. They asked Rabbi Shnel Zaman of Liari, how did you do it? What, what was your secret? Rabbi Shnel Zaman of Liari says, look, no one gave this man ever an opportunity to flex the muscle of his heart. When he came, he, when and people came to him, he would throw, I'm sure he would throw the coin just like he threw at me. And they would be so upset. And they would say, you know, they wouldn't even say thank you, and they would go away. I said, thank you. I said, thank you for flexing the muscle. You didn't flex it all the way, but you flexed it nonetheless, the little coin. So thank you for that. And then when I thanked him, he realized that he had a muscle. He realized that he had a heart. So he did it again. And then he did it again. And then he did it again. And eventually that muscle was completely flexed, that his heart started flowing with kindness. It became a part of him. And in a way, that's... That's, that's the truth about human relationships in general, but certainly about our relationships with ourselves. We have in your muscles that are, aren't flexed, that haven't been flexed, not just physical muscles, but also spiritual muscles. And the question is, are we going to act, work on our garments? Because that's the way to flex them, right? We're going to act in a way that, that will flex those good muscles within us, those muscles of charity or those muscles of study or those muscles of... Um, whatever it may be of, of other mitzvahs, right? Are we going to flex those muscles? And if we give them a chance, then those muscles will flex themselves and will become a part of us. We'll, we'll make the misers into givers, so to speak. And that's, that's the genius of Rabbi Shnoz you understood way before Freud, way before Carl Jung, way mm-hmm. before anyone, some 300 years ago, that your actions can really uh, uh, change your outer you and uh, make that out of you in line completely with who you truly are, the divine person that we each are. Yeah. That became a good habit. That's right. Yeah. That's, yeah. Hmm. You know, who was it? Arnold Palmer, who said that, um, he said, uh, they once asked him, how come you're so good at golf? Because I'm not good, I'm just lucky. <laughs> then he said, but it's funny because the harder I work, the luckier I get. <laughs> hmm. that's, and that's true here. The harder we work on the the luckier we'll get. Yeah. The more luck, that inward luck, 
will come out and express itself. Okay, let's continue a little bit more. Bottom of page 121, the attributes of the soul. Does anyone want to read? I'll read. Please, Margot, please. Okay. The attributes of the soul are integrally bound to the soul's essence. As the soul's essence is immutable, so are its attributes. Chesed cannot be transformed into gurura, and so on. Just as the soul cannot remove and don its body at will. The garments, on the other hand, are separate from the soul's essence. Thus, the faculties of thought, speech, and action can change their function from one extreme to the other, expressing love one moment and fear a moment later. Also, the integral bond between the soul and its attributes means that the very essence of the soul is present in each of them. Thus, the extreme stimulation of one of the attributes, love, fear, and so on, can bring about a pilot hanefesh, dissolution of the soul, chapter three, in the very essence of the soul, something that the soul's garments alone cannot cause. Right, so there's a clear distinction between the soul itself and the, the attributes of the soul on the one hand, and then the garments on the other hand, as we've been explaining. The soul itself is I am, right? Is who we truly are with its attributes. Now, nonetheless, it has attributes that are very well defined, like chesed, gevura, that we've spoken about in the past. Those are unchangeable. There's a part of the soul that only kindness. There's a part of the soul that's only severity and discipline. There's a part of the soul that merges the two, tiferet, that, like we spoke about also. But then you have the garments of the soul. And those, that, like we just spoke about, are, are changeable. But what I want to add here, and this is what Robert Schnauss also is adding in his commentary, and that is that there is this idea that if the garments are in line with the soul, it can then activate, so to speak, the what's inside the, not just the soul itself that divinity but also the attributes of this divinity so say going back to our example say you give tzedakah you've activated the attribute of chesed in the soul if say you are now saying no you're you're exercising impulse control which is gevura you've activated gevura in that soul uh, now each time you each time you act in a divine way, depending on the way that you're acting in, you're activating a different attribute of the soul. The wholesome person, and I would say the tzaddik, right, the righteous person, is a person who's activated all attributes of the soul through his behavior. When he's supposed to be kind, he's kind. That attributes again, that activate again, activates the chesed. When he's supposed to say no, he actually activates gevura. Unfortunately, some people experience this complete imbalance because they're only kind. And when you're only kind, so you may have activated the chesed in the soul, but what about the rest of the attributes? They lay dormant. And being only kind, saying only yes, can also lead to, to the opposite of holiness. When I'm supposed to say no, when I have to say yes, or when I'm supposed to say yes, when I have to say no, then I create a complete confusion. And then the, this activation is, is weakened or maybe eliminated completely. So, so the tzaddik is one who knows exactly how to activate each and every attribute so that his entire soul with all of its 10 attributes are then expressed fully. That's, that's really the idea here that's expressed in Ramesh Townsend's words. But I will say this, that, um, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. Now, I don't know, I have to explore this a little more, but you know, in Israel, there's all sorts of startups and um, high-tech startups. But there is, I just read this what, two weeks ago. There's a new startup in Israel and I'd like to dig into it more, but that can um, computerize and even show um, um, waves of colors of different lights, lights that have different colors. Uh, each time you're doing a good action. When you're doing an action of charity, you have like a white light. When you're doing an action of justice, impulse control, again, you have like a red light. So they, they, this, this new startup actually can pictureize your aura, your spiritual aura. But using, having that in mind, I'm thinking of that now because of what we're saying, but having that in mind, the tzaddik is someone who's actually activated all the colors and he has that perfect symphony of colors. Mm. Other people may or may have only just one color. They're very one-dimensional, which is really not the, not the best, not the ideal. 
Um, so, so those levushim have to try and activate all of the different types of uh, attributes of the soul. Once the soul is completely activated, this is what it's saying here at the end, it can really experience klota nefesh, which means the dissolution of the soul. The soul now is so, so activated that it feels like, that's it, it wants to, to erupt, erupt in such a soulful way that it wants to leave its body. It, it's, it's in a state of complete spiritual ecstasy. The soul has been widely activated. Now, that's, that's what clot and nefesh is. I will add just one more thing. And sometimes, you know, yes, we have to, it's a constant work to do chesed, to activate that part of the soul, gevura, I mean, discipline to activate that part of the soul and so on. But sometimes you have moments where all of the 10 attributes of the soul are activated at once. And um, not because you're doing 10 actions at once or you're wearing 10 garments at once, but simply because um, there is, there is a, a moment of, I would say of, we spoke of nakedness of unclothing the body completely. And I, I think sometimes we experience moments like that, say on Yom Kippur. Some people speak of experiencing moments like that when they go and visit the Kotel in Israel. When you're exposed to holiness, that holiness might be so strong, like such a strong magnet, that with or without the garments, your soul, the full soul in you, is that magnetized and it experiences this, this clot on effort, so to speak. Um, that, but those, again, those moments are very few in life. And most of the time, the only way we can truly express the, the wholesomeness of our soul is, again, by walking on each and every attribute when we are supposed to. But again, that's the idea of clot and effort. Hmm. You know, there's a Hebrew word that the Talmud expounds on. But one of the greatest compliments you could give to someone, at least in the times of the Talmud, uh, was Ish Eshkolot, which uh, literally is translated into the ma a man of grapefruits. Eshkolit, Eshkolot. But uh, the, the intention was not grapefruits. What does es uh, Eshkolot really mean? And the Talmud says, Eshkolot is actually a combination of three words. Ish, Shehakol, Bo which means a person that has everything in him. Eshkolot is a well-rounded person, as they would say in English. Um, he has everything. Now, on a spiritual level, an Ish Eshkolot is just that, someone who's activated all the attributes of the soul and knows exactly when to activate each of them. He lives such a wholesome life that he, he, it's almost natural for him. Now I have to be kind, I'm gonna be kind all the way. I have to be disciplined. I'm going to be disciplined all the way and so on and so forth. That's the ultimate compliment. Mm -hmm. You're as wholesome as, as Isha Kolvo, that you've, you've activated all of those attributes, everything in you. Mm -hmm. All right, any thoughts, comments? It's always the action. It always comes back to the action. Yeah, in a way, yeah, you're right, yeah. At you know? the risk of saying, talking too much, um, I, I was thinking about the people on the street that ask for money and, and how I'm always conflicted because I support the food banks and the things that where they can go and get free food. I don't like begging, but it occurs to me that maybe, but, I, but then I can easily part with the dollar. It won't hurt me and it might help them. So I conflicted all the time and it, when you're talking, it occurs to me, maybe I just give them the dollar and say, go do something nice for somebody else. Right. Maybe that's the answer is pass it along. That's right. And, and then yeah. I've done something good and I've asked them to do something good. I don't know, but it, it's, it's always been a conflict of do I, don't I, but maybe that's how you do it. You. Right. You're right. I, 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 maybe I've said this in the past too, but there's an expression in English, it needs to drop just one word in it. And that expression is the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? Yeah. What word must drop? The road to hell is paved with intentions. Hmm. Drop the word good. 
A person of intentions is always conflicted with his intentions, good or bad, it doesn't matter. That's, that's, that's the road to hell. So what's the road to heaven? The road to heaven is paved with good actions. Hmm. And keep the word good. But with good actions. Whether you had good intentions or not, it doesn't matter. But that's the road to heaven. You're right. And it go, always goes back to action. Hmm. Yeah, beautifully said. So you ask them to have a good action and maybe in some exactly. way you're igniting their goodness. That's right. And regardless of what your intention is. Absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. All right, friends. Well, uh, it's always a pleasure studying with you and being with you. Have a beautiful, healthy, happy, successful week. A week full of good actions. <laughs>